He has been teaching for quite some time the general course in our MA program. I looked it up between 2009 and 2015. Uh, you also have been, and that was new for me, a founding member of the SPD major, Social Policy for Development. I didn't know that, but that's nice to hear and to know. In 2013, you became Associate Professor of Social Policy and Development Studies. And then in 2014, you achieved an ERC starting grant on aiding uh, social protection, the political economy of externally financially social policy in developing countries. In short, aid SOCPRO. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> the project lasted until last year, 2021. Uh, 2016, you joined the editorial board of Development and Change, and you received the International Studies in Poverty Prize, awarded by the Comparative Research Program on Poverty in Bergen in Norway, mm -hmm. and subsequently uh, the set book on poverty as an ideology, was published in 2018, so quite a lot of achievements. Based on those achievements um, and a very steady research output, you received in 2019 as a first associate professor in ISS the Use Promovendi, the right to promote PhD researchers. And you received that from Erasmus University Rotterdam, and it was quite exceptional at that time. Um, the exception was actually that you achieved the ERC starting grant in 2014. Um, so it was a rather exceptional case. And nowadays, just a couple of weeks ago, more associate professors received the use promo and we're very happy with that. But you were the first to be proud of. Uh, and because you do supervise a big group of PhD researchers, one page full in your uh, CV. And besides the PhD researchers in the ERC program, many conduct research, like you yourself, uh, conduct research in many different countries, not only Tibet and China, of course, but also in Brazil, uh, in Ecuador and Paraguay, Colombia, in Cambodia and the Philippines, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ghana, and uh, Zambia. And I'm sure I'm forgetting countries and PhD researchers who might be here, but you're really a global development uh, researcher. It shows from that. You also indicate in your uh, motivational letter for the professorship that you um, work together with researchers in South Africa, USA, Brazil, and of course in London. And in the beginning of last month, when we met in London in the Yadi conference for uh, Development Institute directors, it was very nice for me to see how you operate. You really have a large network there and know almost everyone there. And that was really nice to see. <laughs> very nice. Um, in your professorial plan, you indicate the need for a serious rethinking of inequality. For, uh, from a critical development studies perspective. And I'm sure we will hear more about that today, or maybe another time, but definitely today. In that same professorial plan, you also nicely indicate that you would like that focus on inequality to get that across the different research groups at ISS and the different teaching groups in ISS, really nice. You want to work with other other faculties with uh, the INCLUDE platform at Leiden University, the Africa Study Center, UN, uh, I'm married in Maastricht, so really, again, linking to different um, researchers. Together with other researchers and those in the Global South, uh, you really are a big big networker, I would say. I see where all you go and travel and where you work. In 2019, just before the COVID period started, CRS, and CRS is the Dutch Research School for International Development, led by a consortium of development institutes of several universities in Netherlands and in Belgium, and one participant is here from Belgium, um, indicated that they would like to establish CRS as a long-standing institute um, at ISS. And Georg is not here. I had hoped he would be here, but I want to thank him very much for having the trust uh, in ISS to really establish CRS in uh, ISS. And you uh, became the first ISS scientific director of CRS, started in 2019. And despite all the difficulties before and during Corona, 
you managed in only a few years to really build, rebuild the PhD program with different research, PhD researchers from different institutes, also linking up with EYADI, also linking up with researchers in the Global South. And for that, building that in difficult circumstances, Andrew, um, I think you have been doing a great job. The organizational thing together with the team, but also your teaching modules, asking people to participate in CRS. So I'm quite sure that now we have a kind of stable CRS program here due to your efforts. So thank you very much for that. Uh, it's not only good for CRS, it's also good for ISS. Because we were also and being and we were also enabled to develop our own PhD program further in linking with uh, CRS, as I strongly feel. And then now, finally, as you may say, and maybe your promoter might say, finally you become professor of inequality, social protection, and development. At the end of your motivation letter for this professorship, you write, you wrote. I hope to have sufficiently demonstrated in this letter how I qualify for this professorial promotion. <laughs> yes, you did, Andrew. Uh, with an enthusiastic motivation letter of seven pages, a very clear professorial plan of 11 pages, and then a CV of 17, 17 one seven pages only containing all the information on the work that you have been doing in the past years and that you plan also in the coming uh, period. So yes, you convinced not only the selection committee, also IB and the doctorate board at the Erasmus University Rotterdam. And I'm very happy to welcome you today formally. And that's also on behalf of the Rector Magnificus of Erasmus University Rotterdam as a professor of inequality, social protection and development. Um, that's it from my side. I'm very sure we are eager to hear and listen to your acceptance speech. But before we go to you, I want to introduce the person who is uh, doing the laudatio for you. And that is Professor Tashi Rapki, uh, who will deliver the laudatio. And she's research professor of international affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University in Washington. She speaks online. Very happy to see you, uh, Professor Rapke. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, hear your laudatio for uh, Andrew. Um, please go ahead. And before finishing and letting uh, you do the speech, after the laudatio, if you just come here and start with the lecture. Thank you very much, and please, uh, Professor Rebke. Well, thank you very much. I hope I'm coming through clearly. Um, and I am so sorry that I can't be there with you today, but even from here in Northern Virginia, I can feel the energy, and I just want to say what a true honor it is uh, to be here, to be part of this occasion, to recognize an outstanding scholarly career, and also as a friend to be here to witness uh, a, a real milestone for someone who has lived an inspired life. Um, Andrew's work, as I think uh, all of you probably know, has been driven by his curiosity, uh, by his uh, care, and also his deep conviction uh, that the academy should be relevant for real people and real lives. So now I have this wonderful opportunity to say a few words about Andrew and why he's been a singular figure in the, one of the fields in which I work, which is uh, the study of contemporary Tibet, and tell you why I am absolutely delighted, uh, could not be more thrilled that he is now carrying on his work, his important work, uh, forward, uh, moving forward into uh, the future through this full professorship. Um, and I have to start with how I got to know Andrew, because I think it shows a lot about who he is and the choices that he's made in his life. So before I met Andrew in person, I first came to know his work. But at that time, before State Growth and Social Exclusion, and I'm going to feature this book because I think that this is the one book, because it was his first book, um, that will be overlooked in, in the 
incredible uh, later works that he's been doing. He's been so prolific. But this book in particular, I have to say, State, State Growth and Social Exclusion in Tibet, I can't describe how important it was for the field of contemporary Tibetan studies when it came out. Uh, but before this book came out, he was working incredibly diligently in producing this new literature. Uh, and it was written anonymously, and it was circulated uh, through uh, the channels of international non-governmental organizations around the world. And I had no idea uh, where this uh, incredible new approach to seeing and, and working on Tibet came from, or who was responsible for all this new analytical thinking. So, uh, but I was grateful. I was grateful because as a researcher of contemporary Tibet myself, who was working uh, largely inside Tibet, so working on the ground and in the field, this sudden emergence of new literature and new perspectives uh, came like a flash of lightning, and it suddenly showed us uh, how much more we could know uh, analytically and empirically um, uh, despite our being positioned as global scholars. So what Andrew's early work on Tibet was doing was making new claims to knowledge about uh, how we can understand uh, a, a dispossessed uh, region like Tibet. He was presenting a new form of knowledge that was shifting all of our perspectives. And in fact, he was giving us a new lens through which we could all begin to see. So for me, uh, the work that Andrew was doing in those early days, anonymously, um, was groundbreaking. Uh, and, and that's why I did want to feature his early Tibetan work, uh, because for those of us who were working in the field at that time, uh, this was the, the moment that we realized another set of possibilities were out there. For myself, as someone working on the governance of Tibet uh, from the ground up, uh, I recognized right away how important Andrew's contributions were to uh, what many of us wanted to do. And uh, when, when we finally met at a conference at the University of British Columbia, um, this was, I think, back in 2004, uh, I then only realized that all of this energy, all of this diligent effort and you know, remarkable thinking, rethinking, was coming from one person. It was coming from Andrew Fisher. Um, and so that was when I realized that somehow, somewhere, there there needs to be a way uh, to create new foundations of uh, scholarship, research and scholarship based on uh, a, a lot on what he had been doing uh, on his own earlier. So over the years, we were traveling in different directions, doing comparative work uh, um, in different parts of the world. But every once in a while, it's been such a tremendous pleasure to be able to uh, reconnect and uh, do some test running of, of the kinds of projects that the potential uh, kind of um, uh, showed us. And one of those projects uh, was uh, uh, something called the Tibet Governance Lab, which was launched in 2017 at George Washington University. And Andrew was an integral part of uh, launching that conversation with researchers and scholars who are rising from inside Tibet. Um, they are trilingual and they are doing extraordinary kinds of research. Uh, and um, through that, project, uh, we test ran and developed uh, a research briefing uh, based on Andrew's later work, uh, in particular based on the disempowered uh, development of Tibet in China. And uh, I just bring this up because I think it shows what could be in store if, if we pursued this, kind, this line of research that comes from the inquiry that Andrew had started. Uh, what happened with that research briefing was that we uh, translated it into Chinese and released it into the Chinese social media, so into their public domain. Uh, and in over just 24 hours, there were over 100,000 uh, downloads of our briefing. And not only that, it was not just the scale of, of people seeing and engaging with it. We received a, a note from a woman in Chongqing, I will never forget, uh, it astonished us all, um, and she said to us that uh, two years prior, she had uh, blogged about the fact that Tibetans are self-immolating. And why is this? There must be something wrong if people choose to immolate themselves, and not just one or two, but now over 150 uh, individuals. 
And but that after she blogged that, the security people came to her door the next day and said, we know what you're doing. We saw that and you need to stop. And so she did. She said, for two years, I have said nothing and I have done nothing but wonder inside my own head. Now that I see this uh, policy brief on fiscal policy in Tibet, after all, that's what the title uh, and what the content of the work was. And yet, uh, something that might seem very innocuous uh, about fiscal subsidies, for example, was life-changing for her. She said, this confirms my feeling that there's something very wrong, and yet I don't know what it is, and I don't know how to articulate it. This policy brief is uh, something that in another kind of context may not have such uh, a shattering results, but in the context of an authoritarian state, it changes everything. So what we were trying to do and what Andrew's work really uh, provided a way to do was to create a way to make a critical thinking heard and understood within an authoritarian state. So our research briefing was not deleted. It was not taken out of the public circulation. People could continue and really think about uh, the structural reality of how Tibet is uh, uh, incorporated into the Chinese statehood formation. Uh, and to us, this was incredibly important, what this showed, uh, the sustainability of it, and also that it could make people really become more awake, even in a state like the People's Republic of China. So for the experimentation that Andrew has been willing to do uh, with his work, uh, and in the context of trying to make uh, new forms of knowledge production possible for people who are embedded in states uh, uh, not by choice, um, and yet this is their current reality. So how can we still, as researchers and scholars, continue that work and make it meaningful? I am so grateful uh, for Andrew and his, uh, his extraordinary thinking and his extraordinary energy and uh, just his care for wanting to make uh, his capacities, his, his extraordinary capacities relevant for, for others. Um, so I know that I've given a, a very partial picture of what Andrew has done because in truth, he has made extraordinary contributions as was just beautifully outlined um, in many fields, in the fields of uh, uh, social inequality, developmental economics, and conceptual innovations in many ways. In particular, the poverty of ideology was was uh, a book that we got to launch at the George Washington University on on the state side. Um, but uh, I think that uh, Andrew's early work in Tibet really does show something about the direction he has taken and the trajectory he con continues to pursue. So um, with that, uh, I I want to say that um, Andrew has created a, a body of work, sui generis, unlike any other, um, that has actually helped evolve contemporary Tibetan studies itself. And that's not recognized enough. I think it will be. And I look forward to working with Andrew uh, for all that he's doing in his teaching and in his uh, institutional innovations and, and creating more ways that we can get bright minds into this field um, and to be working in partnership however we can um, uh, from the United States. Um, so uh, uh, on this note, I, I do want to say in closing, though, that um, we now live in uncertain times. We have tectonic shifts happening almost every news cycle, or at least every week. Um, and in particular, with every astonishing thing that we just saw happen in China this past week, um, with the unrest and the mass mobilization that no one expected, all I can say, Andrew, is that your work and your scholarship on contemporary Tibet and the Chinese state in general is far, far from over. I hope that this will fit into your grand picture of many, many things that you are doing because it is so necessary and so needed. I just want to say an enormous congratulations to you, so well deserved, and to your beautiful family who are there with you now. Um, may this be an exciting new chapter for you all. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Tashi. I imagine you're still there, but um, thank you so much for that, uh, those words. Because uh, um, especially, I mean, your friendship, but also the, um, the, um, 
uh, I think the, uh, what's the word again? There's COVID brain, I think, right? Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, confirmation that I think you and, and the people around you have, have given to me has been extremely important, obviously, in giving you the confidence that you need to, to keep doing this work in a sense. Uh, so a huge thanks to you and your friendship. Also, of course, I, I'll do like Lorenzo. I think Lorenzo gave a good example of doing the, the thanks in the beginning instead of the end. So I want to continue that tradition. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, well, thanks to the rector, of course, Inga and, and Arjun uh, who, who are, and, and Karen and others and colleagues, friends and students who've been part of this journey. Um, I, I think I won't mention names for fear of... Uh, of forgetting anyone or also giving an impression there's a hierarchy or priority and I don't want to give that at all. Although I will make an exception, of course, for two people. One, of course, is, well, uh, Ashwani, who's in the audience here, uh, who's, who's been a, a massive figure for me in many ways. And also Max Spohr, uh, who I think is online, uh, who is like our godfather of political ecology group or political economy group or whatever it, 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 it was named in the past. Uh, and of course, thanks to my teachers, one of whom is in the room right now, who's, who's been a huge influence on me as well. And I have to keep thanking, of course, my, my wife, Mary uh, Jean Bocchi, uh, who's my soulmate and a massive inspiration for me. Um, she's, I think, doing far more important work uh, than myself. And our two daughters, Mia and Ava, uh, who are uh, the joy of our lives and part of the reason why I'm often not here, if you're wondering. And if you just saw Ava and her energy, you'd probably understand. Uh, but, um, and also my mother, who would have loved to have been here, but passed away two years ago um, and was by far the most influential person in my life. Um, she was, you know, profound wisdom, but also lived by her ethics in a way that was quite exemplary. And, um, she remains an example for me. So, okay, Whew, got that through. Uh, so the purpose of the lecture right now, I think is, um, as far as I understand, as has been told, is to talk about where I've come from, where I'm at and where I'm going, essentially, right? And um, uh, the most of the lecture I'll try to, I, I believe I have about 40 minutes, shall we start counting now, uh, is, is we'll be on the, the last part where I'm going. Is it okay if we start now? Yeah, okay. Uh, is on the last part of where 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 I'm going, which is very much on this idea of the redistributive imperative, um, uh, and the centrality of that. I think in confronting the major uh, global issues of today uh, uh, that that we're confronting, uh, in, in in a sense, which hopefully by the end of the lecture you'll understand what I'm talking about, and also how this is rooted on what I call the dialect, the dialectic. Of, of, of development and dependency, which also hopefully by the end of the lecture, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And despite claims that we've moved beyond development studies that are often being made, global, global studies and, or global developments and so on, uh, I, I think these issues remain extremely relevant today, if not more than ever, um, especially in certain parts of the world where I think we're being thrown backwards into the 80s and 90s to a certain extent. Um, uh, but first, let me start with the first question, uh, which is where I've come from. And um, uh, if I, uh, a couple a couple of years ago, it was in the BC era, the before COVID era, right? Uh, which was the um, I, we were sitting together, and Julien Francois Gerbert asked me basically, Andrew, why, why don't you uh, work actually on 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 Buddhist economics? And, um, well, the, th the Buddhist economics had never really appealed to me very much because for me there was Buddhism and then there was economics and never the twain shall meet. No, not that bad, but um, the, at least uh, I didn't really see the ne necessity of a synthesis. Um, uh, but what I thought perhaps what was more, um, more to the point is talking about a Buddhist, uh, a Buddhist approach to the philosophy of science, in a sense. Um, and... Um, which I actually, uh, I talked about a bit in my PhD, actually. I think my first seminar at LC was talking about that. Um, and, and this really, I th think, also helps to understand the, 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 the path I took back into academia, which probably many uh, in ISS don't know. But now that I'm a professor, I can just talk about it, right? So, uh, <laughs> so if I can start, in any case, with a short verse that was transmitted to me by my, one of my lamas, uh, the late uh, ninth Kalkha Jetson Dampa Rinpoche, uh, also known as the Bodgogagen of Mongolia, uh, Jampo Namjo Chuki Yeltsin, 
who's a contemporary of Galois from Shea, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, it's an ultra condensed version of the uh, Prajna Paramita, excuse my Sanskrit for those of you uh, who, who know it better than me, uh, which is the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, the core text that encapsulate, encapsulates Buddhist teachings on emptiness, at least for the Mahayana school of, of, of Buddhism uh, and the Madhyamaka uh, approach to Buddhism, which is the foundation for the Tibetan Buddhist traditions. And, um, well, if I just, uh, oops, hold on. Uh, this is, uh, it's not working, the, should I go there? Is that good now? No. Yeah, okay, there we go. So um goes like this. Ma sam jume shara parochin, make me got namke no one, so so drongri yeshi chiyelwa, do some gyawa yumla chaksalo. Chaksalo, I should say. Uh, and uh, which translates as there's a tune that goes with it as well, which my daughters know, but I won't suffer you with that. because uh, <laughs> my lama had a uh uh, uh Ramche had a, a a very a lot of melodic types of um practices but um but it it translates as indescribable inconceivable inexpressible the perfection of wisdom so the shada parochin is the translation of prajna, prajna paramita in tibetan and uh make migag means uh, um oh, the lines there birthless deathless in the nature of space uh I'm not very happy with this translation yet uh, because it, there's a lot of compounded Tibetan terms here that are really complex and deal with deep meaning, but something along the lines of experienced by one's own self-aware wisdom uh, to the mother of the Buddhas of the three times are prostrate. Of course, a lot of the Westerners, when they translate this, they feel uncomfortable with prostrating, so they, they say, I pay homage or something. But, but, <laughs> the, the, but the, the mother of the Buddhas, that's, that's talking essentially about emptiness because the idea is that emptiness is... Um, is uh, is uh, is the source of wisdom, which enlightens and therefore is is what creates produces the Buddha and therefore is the mother of enlightenment in that sense. And so this text is really just talking about enlightenment. Um, I'm sorry, not enlightenment <laughs> about emptiness. Which, but, yeah, and emptiness in this sense is considered ultimate reality. Um, it's not nothingness or voidness, which is the way people often uh, misconceive it. Um, but rather what emptiness is referring to is some things being empty of uh, a false perception of reality, essentially. So things being empty of uh, inherent in existence so that we perceive things. It's essentially talking about the labeling process of the mind, which actually fits a lot with a lot of really recent research on the science of the mind, which is that the mind is constantly at a very subtle level labeling things uh, through, through, through labels, concepts, and so on. Uh, and the, the, even though the mind labels something, it appears back to the mind as if it wasn't labeled, as if it inherently exists from its own side uh, without having been labeled. And that essentially in Buddhism is the essence of ignorance. Um, it's that emptiness uh, then that cuts, that, if the understanding of emptiness, that cuts uh, ignorance and then there becomes liberation and, and so on and so on, um, all, all the rest. Um, uh, and... Uh, but the thing is, is that um, uh, emptiness in this sense, it can't be conceived, conce uh, can it can't be conceived, it can't be, uh, you can't understand uh, emptiness through conceptual thought. So that's why the first line of the verse of the Masam um, Jume is the indescribable, inconceivable, and in, in, inexpressible is basically is basically saying this. It's, it's you you have to perceive directly with your mind uh, emptiness. Uh, you can't uh, actually conceive of it. Um, but even though you can't conceive of it, you can logically approach an approximate understanding of it. And this is where I'm getting back more to my path back into social sciences because this is very similar actually to what we would call the deductive method in, in, so, in sciences or in social sciences or what maybe some people would call positivism in a sense. Um, in the sense that both are based on re, uh, refutation rather than uh, affirming things. So as we know in statistical methods, for instance, uh, as we remind ourselves constantly in stats, you can never actually definitely identify causality. Instead, what we're doing is removing, refuting false hypotheses about 
uh, to get ourselves closer and closer and closer to a point of truth or understanding without actually ever being able to affirm that, right? And then, of course, in Buddhism, the step to actually being able to directly perceive emptiness is done through meditation, which we don't do in sciences, but maybe we should. I don't know. Uh, or, or maybe they do now in certain parts of the world. I'm not sure. Um, but even though emptiness, in a sense, can't be conceived, its inverse can be conceived. And its inverse is essentially the inverse of things not existing inherently from their own side is essentially things existing in dependence on everything else. And so the inverse of, uh, of uh, emptiness, in a sense, is, is interdependence. Some people translate it as dependent arising. And so what, we, what, what they, they then say is that emptiness and interdependence are two aspects, two sides of every single phenomena in, in, in sort of the universe, so to speak. Um, and when you realize this, you realize the si simultaneous realizations of wisdom and compassion. Um, and, and this is why in Tibetan Buddhism or Mahayana Buddhism more generally, uh, there's such an important emphasis on cultivating the mind of compassion because it's in harmony with wisdom. It's in harmony with this view. Uh, and therefore, it's considered to be sort of a very powerful path, whereas hatred is the opposite. Hatred cultivates ignorance in that sense and separation and, and false perception and so on. So here I'm not referring to Buddhism, um, uh, uh, Buddhist religion as a social institution grounded in political economy, which, of course, is an entirely different story. Uh, I don't think there's any shades of, of what we're talking about here in terms of, you know, compassion and so on uh, in a lot of these nationalist movements uh, coming out of uh, certain nationalist movements, at least coming out of Buddhist societies, such as in Myanmar uh, with the Rohingya and Bhutan with the, the, the ethnic cleansing of the Nepalese Bhutanese and or in Thailand and Sri Lanka and so on. Uh, I, I've studied myself, uh, Tibetan, just <laughs> coming out of my PhD research uh, without planning it necessarily, Tibetan prejudices towards uh, Muslims in Tibet, for instance, uh, and a conflict that was emerging in that context, which James knows quite well from my work. So I think it's important to make this distinction between sort of the philosophical view and the social uh, sort of institutional realities that take these views and turn them into ideologies of power in that sense. But nonetheless, if you would make this distinction, um, for me, I think uh, this, this path back into social sciences for me was through this concept of in inter interdependence, which spiritually we might say interdependence expresses itself through compassion, but in political economy, interdependence expresses itself through redistribution, right? And I think this is, um, uh, this is the point I essentially want, wanted to get to. Um, uh, um, oh, sorry, I lost the page. Where did I? Oh, yes, so, no, okay, there. So, um, uh, as this chair in inequality, social protection, and development, uh, my intention is to focus less, perhaps, on the measurement of inequality, uh, which I think there's already a very crowded field of the measurement of inequality, which I'll show you in a moment, but more on this fundamental role of redistribution, the role that redistribution plays uh, in mediating inequality, but also conditioning development, uh, and, and also how developmental processes also then have uh, feedback on inequality, which is a lot of what I was researching uh, in, in my research on Tibet that Tashi was referring to. Uh, and I should clarify here by development, just to get this out of the way, so we're clear what I'm talking about when I say development. I, I essentially refer to what for me is the most essential meaning of development as structural transformation, economic and social structural transformation. Um, uh, with, like it or not, industrialization and demographic transition at the core. Right? For me, I think this is really uh, uh, the, the essence of what we're talking about. Um, I won't elaborate further here. I've written articles on it. You can read them. Uh, so, but my point about then the importance, the central role of redistribution in development uh, and what I call this redistributive imperative development isn't just a conviction, uh, but I believe it's logic, it has logical and empirical support. Um, and what I refer to the redistributive imperative of development, I'm talking also about this necessity of a massive scaling up of redistribution far beyond what we've been doing so far in the world today at a global and international level in particular uh, to be able to deal with the breadth and depth of the types of crises that we're facing, foremost climate, but also things like the emergent debt crisis right now that I, th I, th I believe we're not talking about enough alongside other 
uh, ongoing development needs and so on. It's an idealist position in the sense that I don't see ourselves going <laughs> that way at all, and I don't have much hope in the near future that we're going in that direction at all. But I think even if it's idealist in its absence, um, uh, we're, we're really looking uh, at dystopic futures uh, in a sense um, in, in, in terms of climate crisis and so on. Uh, dystopic futures that are really being built on what Tandika Makandari would refer to, refer to as a world economy of maldistribution right? uh, compounded by climate crisis. Also, I would focus on global uh, redistribution uh, because despite, again, as I said, uh, the claim that we've moved beyond development studies and now the world is converging and so on and we need to think about things in a new way, uh, I, I, I feel that's overdone. And I think actually, um, well, this is, for, for instance, from a recent paper from Branko Milanovic, uh, where it's just pointing out that even according to his estimates from 2018, more than half of global inequality across all people in the world is accounted for by between country inequalities. And so we still li live in a world where between country inequality is still massive. Um, and of course, based on my friend and colleague Andy Sumner and his co-authors, uh, their recent work, a paper that just came out as well, obviously even that convergence that Branko Milanovic is talking about is mostly due to China. So once we remove China, we see that red line there, that a much less significant reduction of inequality that is now currently stalling or to, to the, the latest data we know is currently stalling. Um, but even then, even Branko and Andy's work, if I use the first names, uh, is based on PPPs, is based on purchasing power parities. And the purchasing power parities, in my mind, is very problematic because it compresses uh, inter-country comparisons. Uh, so it, it compresses them because basically you're, you're treating equivalent a Dow meal in Delhi with uh, uh, an expensive burger in, in London or something like that. Uh, and so if we actually would calculate these things according to market exchange rates, which I feel is the right way to do it because it, it properly reflects actual international purchasing power and hence monetary power and so on. Uh, then actually these intercountry differences would be much greater and the role of the intercountry differences uh, would be by far the largest component of global inequality that we're looking at today. So I don't think we're out of the, out of the, out of the, out of the woods, so to speak, in that sense. Um, now, when it comes to distribution, obviously I, I would say also we're dealing with a world where the current orthodoxy is, is still very dour about distribution. It, it still sees it in a very, okay, maybe we'll do some of it, but with qualifications and controls and so on. Uh, they make promises and pledges, but most of them are, are, are failed. Um, and we're seeing this being repeated over and over again. Um, and I mean, just as an example, Oxfam came out with quite a re good report last year, pointing out that for instance, as of 15th of March, 2021, Shorty feels like ages ago, 85% uh, of the 107 COVID-19 loans negotiated between the IMF and 85 governments indicate plans to undertake austerity once the health crisis abates. And a lot of these plans are already in motion now, even in the context of many of these countries uh, being in quite intense debt crises as we speak. Um, many of them in Africa, uh, many of them outside Africa. Um, so... Um, but also, I've, I would also note that I think there's a certain bias in, heter in heterodox economics also against redistribution, uh, which I've noticed uh, partly um, due to um, in the developmental state literature or neo-developmentalism. And it's partly, I think, because of an overemphasis of the productive origins of the East Asian developmental states, which I'll get back into. Uh, and it's probably also because of a certain discomfort with the extent of financialization that exists in many countries like Brazil, for instance, where neo-developmentalism is coming out of, and they would like to somehow taint, pull that back. But their, their skepticism is also understandable uh, because rich countries have been very, very counterproductive towards global, uh, towards redistribution and towards uh, the reduction of global inequalities in that sense. Um, uh, both in re counterproductive towards global redistribution, but also counterproductive towards a lot of national redistribution in developing countries um, or global South countries or majority world or whichever term you wish to use. Um, 
uh, a few examples. The international aid system has mostly failed, I would suggest, uh, especially if we look at it through the lens of the actual absorption of aid rather than just the disbursements or promises of aid. Where, because most aid, as we know, doesn't even enter, doesn't even end out in the recipient country, but is spent largely in, 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 in the countries of, uh, that disperse it. There was a recent study that came out from the Center of Global Development that showed that I think 91% of USAID aid is actually spent in the US, and they actually track it down. And, and this is more than what I thought. I thought it was like 85, but you know, 91%. But it's just to say. Um, but also, even when the aid is delivered, it's delivered, as we know, through with conditions that are often quite inimical to redistributed processes in the recipient countries. Uh, you know, one particular point is the, 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 the sort of the consistent uh, uh, erosion of movements towards universalistic social policy uh, by international organizations, uh, which universalistic social policy even if it's not fully, you know, fully uh, existent in a lot of these countries, nonetheless, the gradual movements towards universalism and social policy are crucial for more egalitarian forms of development, as emphasized by uh, Tandiko Mikandiri, Jimmy Adeshina, uh, Diego Sanchez Sancochea, myself, uh, I've written a few things about that too, and so on. On the other hand, the alternative that, say, the World Bank really pushes uh, to the idea of financing development is really rooted on this idea of using private finance and, in particular, foreign direct investment. But the problem with foreign direct investment is that um, uh, it's not actually redistributive. It's, it's just <laughs> the assets remain in the ownership of the person who buys them. It transfers cash in exchange for the asset. And then the asset and all those income flows that come out of that asset remain with the investor, not with the, 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 the government. So it's not redistributive uh, at all. Uh, in addition, we have liberal tax and investment regimes uh, that, um, that basically are allowing for and permitting, well, illicit financial flows, but also perfectly illicit financial flows uh, which I'll also show you uh, soon. If I hurry up, I'll show you. Uh, and also a lot of the negotiations on illicit financial flows and international tax uh, uh, treaties and so on have mostly been, whatever progress has been made has mostly be, uh, been about concerns between rich countries and not actually the concerns from the global south that have been more or less sidelined. Uh, and then finally, of course, the global private financial system is fundamentally regressive, the same way it is within Europe, in the sense that it penalizes poor countries uh, with high interest rates uh, and more onerous terms. And then also, uh, given the sort of center periphery nature of the international financial system, um, uh, the global south countries typically uh, uh, get the worst effects of financial instability when it happens. And so, and this is what's happening right now, as I point, you know, this is just the UN raising the alarm bell with a recent report. Uh, the UNCTAD raising the alarm bell, I think that's UNCTAD again, or maybe the two first ones. The World Bank comes in with a not so alarm belly type of, are we really ready? Uh, and then no, not the question, the answer is no. And then uh, of course the IMF comes in also with a report but frames it more in terms of inflation. But they're all raising the alarm bell that currently right now we're facing a, actually a massive, massive crisis, economic financial crisis in the global south. Um, uh, and so against this, against this trend of, of, of regressive redistribution from poor to rich, uh, we can then, say, take a, a moral position and advocate for progress reversing this, progressive redistribution, uh, through various frames, reparations, which I would agree, tend to agree with. It's a more justice-based approach with some qualifications. Or uh, in terms of solidarity, as a recent Yadi conference chose to emphasize, or a more traditional a conservative patronizing char a notion of charity. However, what my interest is is more specifically on the, the necessity of the structural necessity of redistribution as a core function of com modern complex economies um, and societies based on both historical experiences and the increasingly in contemporary experience as well. And this is what I would say coming to the main title of the lecture is based on two fundamental dialectics uh, of development that we've been observing, in particular in the post-war era. And by what I mean by dialectic is quite simply, I know there's different approaches and so on, uh, but essentially, you know, when you have two parts that apparently look contradictory, but work synergistically together in, in, in creating the dynamic, historical dynamic of a system. Um, and the first dialectic is what I would say 
is how redistribution needs to be understood as an intrinsic synergistic complement of production and distribution. So not as this sort of uh, uh, a trade-off with production as it's conceived in mainstream economics, but more as an intrinsic, intrinsic complement of production and distribution through its crucial role in socializing the wealth of increasing and increasingly concentrated productivity in physical or tangible production. Um, I could go on and talk about that, but uh, for the sake of time, uh, let's speed through it. Uh, and what I would suggest as well is without this complement, complex modern economies uh, become distorted and dysfunctional. Uh, to use the term from Celso Furtado, the organized forms of development have difficulty taking root. Uh, and I think it, it, this is important because I think a lot of the dysfunctionalities of development that we've been observing over the last 40 years of neoliberalism uh, have been uh, related to the undermining of redistributive processes in that sense. Um, uh, obviously, there's also underlying this uh, the role of the state is obviously implicitly and essential in this, uh, which I, I, I won't go on in the written text. I'll, I'll expand on this more. Uh, the, the role of the state in organizing and implementing distribution, uh, also in international representation, but also the role that redistribution gives to bolster state capacity, which I think is very important. But we obviously have to important, uh, be aware of the dark sides of redistribution or the dark sides of, of, of the state that's... Uh, uh, using redistribution for repressive or discriminatory means, uh, which, as Tashi was referring to, my research in Tibetan areas was very concerned about, or my previous experience looking at indigenous regional development strategies in Canada, for instance, it also brings to evidence where you have the combination of quite racist policies implemented through increasing transfer <laughs> payments and increasing so-called uh, uh, um, objective measures of development in that sense. My mother was actually very deeply involved in the native struggles against this, as well as Yoka, who I don't know if she's here right now, because she was, but uh, I don't see Yoka. She was going to join a good friend of my mother who was, who was maybe the strikes stopped her. Um, um, but obviously we have to be careful, obviously, in, in it's, it's a catch-22, because on one hand we have to be careful about the state, but on the other hand, uh, we have to also be careful about the anti-state bias that I think uh, we, we struggle with in development studies um, because it, it, it easily harmonizes with the neoliberal crit criticism of the state um, uh, and undermines the state as the only real institutional form that we have that has the capacity to redistribute over na a national scale, right, in that sense. And also, as Barbara Harris-White famously, you know, as points out, the problem... Yes, you know, so the, the, the state forms of social regulation can be repressive and discriminatory, but usually non-state forms of regulation, social regulation can often be worse, as in when you have uh, the, 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 the strengthening of caste or class or, or race uh, relations uh, outside of state uh, types of social processes. So we need to uh, use the state, but be wary of it and guard against its abuse. So... Um, what, what I would also suggest is this dialectic intensifies the further you move into late development and advanced capitalism and also demographic transition, in part because of the increased burden that these structural processes place on tertiary sectors of employment. I don't have time to expand on it here, but um, this it relates to what I would call a Gershenkronian redistributive principle, re related, referring to the work of Alexander Gershenkron on la the late industrialization and where he, he, his basic premise was that the later the industrializer, the greater the intensity of catching up is required, the greater the revol role of state intervention is required to the extent that the state even sometimes takes on the role of being the capitalist in, 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 the, in the context of, uh, of uh, having a weak capitalist class, the greater the reliance on banking and bank state relations. But also, and what's crucial for redistribution is the uh, greater that basically when you look at the later industrializers, they preempt the introduction of universal social policy earlier than what would be predicted by the industrial leaders like the UK, even in historical times. So Germany, for instance, was introducing moves towards universalizing social security um, before, uh, even decades before the UK was doing so. So it all, and it also um, dismisses the argument that, you know, there's a sort of logical uh, sort of uh, stages uh, of, of doing this and so on. Um, interesting, a lot of my work then has been looking at, uh, looking at these ideas through, uh, through the cases of South Korea, Taiwan, and China, 
Um, the, again, these are the cases that really inform the developmental state literature and the neo-developmentalism thinking. Uh, and I think what, the, the role of redistribution in these cases has been really underemphasized in a lot of this literature. Uh, it needs to be re, uh, sort of uh, reinserted and reemphasized and reexamined, especially in the case of China, I would say. Um, in the case of South Korea and Taiwan, it's well known, for instance, that they were uh, they had extensive land reform, which James has taught us decades and <laughs> generations of students, reminding them about the role of uh, land reform in South Korea and Taiwan, which is essentially asset redistribution. Uh, the very rapid expansion in the 50s of near universal education and healthcare, which is crucial for the development experience of both South Korea and Taiwan. And I would just say the, the remarkable reductions in death rates uh, in, if you, uh, the pointer, I don't know, the green line there in the lower thick green line is just the reduction in death rates in South Korea, which is a good 10 years ahead of China in that sense. Uh, but also, um, uh, we can't really see the speed by which it was occurring in Taiwan right after the Second World War within the space of five to 10 years, this dramatic dropping of, of death rates in Taiwan, which was related to the universal expansion of healthcare across the population in a very, very short period of time in a context where the country was very poor uh, and not yet industrialized and uh, it, having a lot of financial instability um, and coming out of a complex situation. Um, so um, China is more complex because China, what we have is the collapse of the Maoist social security system in the early 80s which really messes up the whole nice sort of streamlined story of inequality from the 60s up to the present. Um, uh, but the principles, at least in the 60s and 70s, which Ashwani was written about, uh, were, uh, were similar to South Korea and Taiwan in terms of the rapid expansion of basic health and education, uh, but at a far greater scale, at a continental scale, as opposed to a small country. Um, there was also in China, and this is what I've studied a lot in my research on Tibet, uh, which Tashi was referring to as a regional redistribution system um, that was uh, established at the time of Maoism, which then collapsed in the 80s within the space of one or two years or three years. Uh, but then in the 90s was then being revived and rebuilt, uh, which my, my research here has looked at. It was partly organized around a major tax reform in 1994 when the central government regained control over the majority of, 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 um, of revenue between the center and the provinces. Uh, and through that was able to sort of revive these redistributive strategies, which then allowed for this massive subsidization of these Western and central provinces in China, which were very, very poor at the time. And since then, you've been seeing this, this um, uh, ongoing subsidization, increasing levels of deficit spending at the provincial level, uh, all being financed through uh, the strengthening of this redistributive regional system in China, uh, which basically was what my research on Tibet was looking at. Um, uh, because again, there's the dark sides of this as well, right, that we have to look at. Um, uh, China, though, also has some of the uh, other sides, which is that they've, of course, in this process, reached very high levels of what I like to call Latin American levels of inequality, uh, uh, peaking at about 10 years ago, uh, and also an increasing informalization of the urban labor market, which is very problematic, which sets it aside from South Korea and Taiwan. Um, but one thing that China, and I, I think um, I'll, I'll manage to finish in time if I calculate starting at 30, uh, the six, but um, the, you're not looking at your watch yet, that's good. Um, the, 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 the I think what China also, um, I'm sure my daughters are bored though, aren't you? Yes. No, hold on, hold on. We're almost done. The, 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 I think the, the, the further problem with the Grishin Cronian principle is that it's conceived at a national scale. Uh, and yet what we've been seeing is that, um, uh, uh, and China definitely demonstrates this, is that value is increasingly circulating at an international global le level, particularly through the vehicle of transnational corporations. And so the Gershon Cronian redistributed principle needs to become international. It needs to become transnational in that sense, right? Um, at a time when the state's capacity to then regulate beyond its borders is, 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 is being curtailed, besides the US, of course, which can tax everyone around the world. Um, if you wish, but in any case, um, now obviously this transnational element was always there um, uh, since colonialism, because colonialism we we had the same things going on uh, in terms of the the expropriation of value uh, from the imperial centers of their colonies and so on. 
uh, often also through private firms, which are the precursors to the modern global corporation. Uh, but nonetheless, what we've seen in the post-war period is the increasing, throughout the pre-neoliberal and neoliberal period, uh, increasing uh, the depth and extensiveness of foreign ownership in the global south, uh, which is something I think we don't need talk enough about. Uh, and, and so the problems are no longer just about how do we domestically channel the wealth from parts of the economy to other parts of the economy, but how to prevent the siphoning out of the economies altogether, which has become a major, major issue of international financial flows and so on, which leads us to the second dialectic, uh, which is the dialectic, well, this is really the dialectic of uh, d development and dependency, which is really referring to um, um, which highlights the global dimension of the redistributive imperative. Uh, and it's basically drawing off something I'm working on a lot these days, which is the idea of these external constraints. So you have external or foreign exchange constraints, uh, in, in, which was an idea that really comes out of early development economics, but it's still very relevant today. It might not seem relevant when there's a slo money sloshing around, uh, uh, but as soon as we go into a period of monetary tightening as we are now, suddenly everyone realizes how important the monetary constraints are, how important the foreign exchange constraints are. You know, you just hear news about, you know, country after country across the global south basically having shortages of foreign exchange and the massive impact this has on their economy and society. Um, and it's because basically uh, the late industrialization itself there's, has a ten chronic tendency to, uh, to, uh, for, for running trade deficits because of the important intensity of development. Because, because development essentially is very intensive, it, it requires a huge amount of imports because of the dependence on capital and into intermediate inputs into the entire economic structure. Now, not just industry, but pretty much everything in between. But as we can see from the photo here, which I took about a month ago in Dakar, uh, it's the, one of the main port area. I mean, if you look at the photo, besides maybe the yellow walls there and the, and the rooftops and so on, pretty much everything uh, the more of the economic infrastructure of this photo is entirely based on imports, right? Uh, and they are, it's entirely based on foreign investment. It's entirely based, uh, or, or on foreign, uh, perhaps Mary knows some of the projects, <laughs> but the, 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 uh, you know, the port, the, the entire economic infrastructure that allows for trade, for instance, that the country then depends on. Uh, that we see in the distance is, 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 is the country produces absolutely none of that, right? So, <laughs> or we can give other examples, for instance, <clears throat> how, uh, you know, we talk about the benefits of using mobile phones. Farmers get to know about prices quicker and, and so on. And so, but n all of that is predicated on first establishing a mobile phone network in your country, which I believe in Kenya way back when cost something like three billion US dollars, right? So just establishing these networks and then managing them and having the management contracts to maintain them uh, and update them to 3G, 4G, 5G, and so on, is, is this incredible, it puts these countries into this incredible sort of import dependence, which then requires foreign finance to finance. Uh, and then that becomes the constraint. So the idea here is not that the constraint is, 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 is or the releasing of the constraint is causing development, but when the constraint is tightened, it definitely cripples development. It basically undermines development and has a, a very profound effect on the way, the trajectory that countries move in. And it also is, an, uh, it also drives a lot of inequality in the global south in very different ways than it does in the global north, because it sets up a typical type of structural setting where you, you have, you know, where there are foreign investment interests in an economy, there is lots of cash. There is lots uh, of, of uh, but it, so it sets up these enclave type sectors, whereas the rest of economy that doesn't have access to those flows is essentially living in austerity, which is actually the model I use to analyze Tibet that I think Tashi found so, so, so refreshing. And another point here is that it's the same for decarbonization in the sense that if we envisage decarbonization strategies or climate adaptation strategies, that are based on uh, not moving back to sort of peasant forms of production and so on, but actually based on using latest technology to decarbonize production while also allowing for increasing productivity, these will necessarily most likely be very import intensive, like the establishment of green hydrogen across Africa that's occurring right now, that uh, Daniela Gabor talks about, and, and Ndongo Sambasila as well. Uh, or like these establishment of mega wind farms and solar, solar farms, all of which in most of these countries are massively important, uh, dependent, um, uh, into, uh, in that sense. 
Um, and so the key thing is when, <clears throat> when you have a boom time, of course, it all seems fine, but when it starts to dry up, then you see the more um, perverse aspects of this, this dependency revealing itself uh, in crisis and so on. But it's also, it talks about a, a synergy between redistribution and development that I think is very important because what redistribution allows for is releasing of these constraints. So countries just by virtue of that start to breathe and then the internal causes of development can then happen. So, so I mean, this was the ration, this was the post-war rationale for aid, for instance. It wasn't as Jeffrey Sachs would like to think, poor countries are poor, therefore they don't have a lot of savings, we have to help them out. But it's because poor countries are attempting to industrialize. They can mobilize their own savings, thank you very much, but they need foreign exchange. Can you give us some, right? And, and this was the original rationale for aid that still is pertinent today because countries today are very foreign exchange constrained. Um, and um, uh, it was also the, the, the idea behind the Marshall Plan in Europe, for instance. Or even you could argue colonial transfers played a similar role for the colonial imperialist powers in terms of themselves balancing their their external accounts in the context of intensive industrialization. Um, I, I, I give a lot, uh, oh, I was gonna give this an example of basically how, you know, if you have a government, Zambia, which is a country I've looked at, for instance, um, <clears throat> a lot, and, and uh, this is just an example of how, you know, if you, if you have a, the government comes along with a bucket list of everything, they, every development project they would like to do, if they could finance it, pretty much all of it involves foreign exchange. Uh, where he, we see here about one third of government expenditures are in foreign exchange or foreign finance. And they're mostly in the asset category. There are things like rural electrification. There are things like water and sanitation, plumbing, uh, sewage in the city, and so on. So these are real, real de development needs. It's not like somebody said, this is how, this is how, you know, how you should be developed. And it's some, you know, it's no, it's having proper sewage system in your city to prevent disease and so on. Um, and, um, um, uh, so I was going to show this, just the slide. I don't have time to explain this, but I have a whole article on it. It's just the demonstration of how South Korea and Taiwan actually uh, proved the rule in a sense, because contrary to often popular opinion, even though they were export oriented, they went through a 30 year period of intensive trade deficits uh, while they were going through these in intensive stages of industrialization. Uh, and this was financed first by aid and then by debt. And then when the debt crisis in 82 hit, there was a huge surge in public debt that Latin America, say, for instance, didn't benefit from. Um, uh, again, I'm not saying here that uh, the aid caused the development. Obviously, the causes of development were more like what we, we learned from, from James and, and other scholars of the developmental state and industrial policy. Uh, and here we can give the example of Philippines, which also runs intense chronic trade deficits over many decades, uh, but it's more better to conceive it as a sort of uh, remit remittance consumption model rather than um, uh, rather than a developmental state model or developmental model. And I can see the Filipinos nodding their heads, say, which, which is my confirmation that I'm correct. So this is I don't have to do a confirmation test or anything. To, to <laughs> anyways, uh, and and but just to, uh, just, I'm, I'm wrapping up very soon. But the the the, the problems is that in the absence of the foreign exchange, uh, well, or debt. In the absence of aid, a significant amount of aid, as say South Korea and Taiwan benefited from in the 50s and 60s, or or public debt, and the abs then you reliance on commercial debt is very unstable, uh, invariably results in crisis, especially because it's typically priced too high. Uh, we celebrate when say Ghana gets a, a sovereign debt of six to eight percent, but I personally would not have bought a house if I had a mortgage of eight percent plus a whole bunch of extra costs hidden in, underneath. Uh, and and um, uh, so then you rely on foreign direct investment, but that is where the dependency then comes back in because foreign direct investment is, is essentially denationalizing your economy, especially the lucrative sectors of your economy, which is what foreign investment is interested in. And this is where I would just give the example of Zambia, because for me, I've been updating my data on this. Uh, for the conference I was at in Dakar, and it's actually, it's actually, it's depressing. It's, it's, it's dramatic because what we have seen in Zambia is, is parallel to the green line, the black line. The black line is the, the export booms, uh, from copper, the, from copper. And the green line is foreign direct investment coming in, Glencore and others to, 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 to mine the mines and invest in the mines and so on. We have the underneath that, the blue line and the red line are your regular outflows of profit remittances, but also on the service account, because of course the, multi, the 
the global corporations are then charging for a whole bunch of services that they're providing to exploit the mines and so on. But what's crucial is what I was detecting in my research in, in Zambia was this obscure account hidden away in the financial account that didn't make any sense whatsoever. And during my field work in Zambia, I got I managed to talk to some central bank people who were working specifically on this. And they explained that they were also trying to figure it out, but it, they were pretty sure that it had to do with what we would call illicit financial flows. Basically, unreported uh, uh, tax uh, or profit remittances, probably most likely by the mining companies, because everything in Zambia has to do with the mining companies, as they say, uh, or it might be some supermarkets like ShopRite or whatever. But basically what's happening is that as the economy is booming, these illicit flows are also booming in the other way. And pretty much more than the totality of, of both the gain of the, both the surpluses from copper and the foreign direct investment are being drained out of the economy simultaneously by illicit financial flows, which is something that global, a lot of global South actors are really up in arms about is this is the major issue they're confronting with. But what's most striking here is that Zambia went into default in 2020. And, and then in the midst of default and negotiating with the IMF and with creditors, about how do we treat China? How do we treat, you know, pri you know, hedge funds and so on? Uh, the, the, this, this category of what is most likely illicit financial flows just plummeted to the point where it is minus 29% of GDP. This means that almost one third of GDP left the country in a year in the midst of a, of a debt crisis, in the midst of protracted negotiations of the IMF. And it, within these negotiations, no one's talking about this, right? Uh, so you're having this, this sort of, this is what I was talking about, this very polarized type of situation where you have investment. Well, actually, currently not much investment going into mining, but that might change. Uh, the 2022 has probably already changed. Uh, parallel to the sucking out of value from the economy that creates austerity everywhere outside where the foreign investment is not, is not focused. Um, and, and of course, uh, coming out of this, Zambia, if I can just belabor this point for a few moments more, uh, looking at your watch. Z I mean, Zambia and these de net debt negotiations, where they're, they're basically agreeing upon now, is then required to then move from a de budget deficit position to a budget surplus position, a primary surplus, to be able to pay off the international creditors. The effect of that is basically a decimation of public expenditure. It's a decimation of public investment. And so we're basically throwing the country back into the 1980s or 1990s, where they'll have about 10 years basically running uh, primary surpluses to pay off creditors uh, at the cost of basically gutting education and health and salaries and, and every other government function that you can think of, unless it is at the service of international investors, uh, which is just the reality that is going on right now. Um, and... Um, uh, and this is in one country, but it's happening, the same pattern is happening throughout Africa and Pakistan and Sri Lanka and, and elsewhere. Um, so, uh, and in each, so Glacian, you can always look at specific reasons of why the elites may be messed up and so on. But when it's a general systematized pattern, as Carlos Diaz Alejandro once famously said, it's easy to blame the victims when they're far from virtuous, right? But it's still not, the, the point is not uh, that that was necessarily the cause of the crisis. Um, the, the, um, okay, so ways to address, I probably run out of time. You're looking at your watch. Uh, as I said, it's an idealist position. We're moving in the opposite direction, but it is urgent. It is urgent. If we don't address it, we're facing down, uh, we're looking down the, um, you know, at dystopia in a sense. Um, and um, uh, especially the emergence of like what we might call these Polanyan conservative and reactionary double movements or this retreat like of Europe back into sort of this apartheid like uh, 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 racial nationalist uh, global hierarchies and so on. Um, uh, as a response to the dislocations and our inability to confront them at, at a more global scale. So... Um, so while my, what I'm suggesting is this massive scaling up of redistribution is idealist, uh, we can nonetheless, we need to imagine ways of how to reverse it and how to address it. Uh, beyond the conventional frames of taxing and spending, which is usually the way redistribution is always talked about and is very limiting, I would suggest. Uh, one is plugging this massive hemorrhaging of wealth. Uh, two is reforming the international and financial system, and that's nothing new. We've been screaming it for years. Uh, 
another one which is perhaps more radical is a return to ideas of asset redistribution at a global scale or things like nationalization or renationalization. Obviously, this is very contentious, could be very problematic, but I think as an economic strategy, we need to be bringing it back onto the table, especially when you're looking at situations like this. Um, but even then, any just transition will need more than this and will re need require a massive scaling up of resources directed towards the global self. And basically, going forward, my research intends to keep digging on these points, in addition to continuing to research on China uh, and Tibet. Um, so just to re return to the, the, the Buddhist dialectic of emptiness and interdependence, which I feel expresses itself most succinctly in political economy and social sciences as redistribution, um, uh, that is genuine redistribution of resources in a way that respect people's self-determination. Uh, um, it, it is idealist, uh, but I simply cannot think of any other path forward, either morally, theoretically, or empirically. So I think we have to face it. And that's basically my message. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, do I have to stay there? Was I supposed to take off my hat when I was talking? Or? No, 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 I was, I was. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. You're welcome. And this was an agreed, this was an agreed signal eh, that I would yeah, watch yeah, yeah. my watch. Well, ten minutes over. Ten minutes, uh, five, 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 ten, ten, ten minutes. Ten, five, oh, that's yeah. fine. It's, it's okay. Great. It's okay. You did great. Yeah. You did great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. With becoming a professor. And we can now to celebrate it. So I invite all of you to come with us to the atrium and please do take your family, the promoter yeah. with you and we are at the head of the cortege. We follow you okay. and we're going to celebrate with your professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.